Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, this meeting is now officially being recorded as there is a quorum. Um, should I call the meeting to order? If you want to wait a few minutes, that's okay. Okay, I'll wait a few minutes. Um, Brianna and Alicia, did Paul send you guys an email that explained that he was going to be sharing your recommendations to the finance committee? No, I, I, or if so, I didn't receive it. Um, I don't think. <clears throat> okay, this is what it is. The finance committee is to review the town manager's budget line items, and I will be addressing the items that the SWG prepared in its recommendations. I don't know if that helps for us at all. Well, I don't I don't want to jump on the agenda, but I at some point tonight I'd like to go back to the email he sent us last Thursday. Okay. So um I would you can call the meeting to order now, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Brianna Owen and I'm calling the meeting to order as the co-chair of the Community Safety Working Group. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual meeting of the working group. Given that we have a quorum present, I'm calling the May 26th meeting of the Community Safety Working Group to order at 6.03 p.m. I will call upon each member of the working group by name. At that point, you should unmute yourself um, and say present, and this will indicate that we can all hear each other. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Um, Ms. Walker? Here. Mr. Vernon Jones? Present. Ms. Ferreira? Here. Mr. Cage? Present. Uh, I wanna take a couple of minutes to review the agenda. We will first hear any public comment that members of the community or members of the public want to provide the working group. We will not respond to your comments, but listen to your comments carefully. Um, we will then focus the bulk of our discussion today on a debriefing from the town council meeting that happened on Monday. Our first order of business is public comment. If any member of the public would like to make a statement, please raise your hand. I will recognize you and ask Ms. Moyston to turn on your microphone. I ask that comments be limited to no more than three minutes. The working group will not be responding to your comments, but listening carefully. I pulled up the wrong agenda because that was yesterday. So just one moment and I'll be able to show you today's agenda. And no one in the audience has their hand up for public comment, right? No, they do not. Okay. So the next item we can move to is um, members report. At this time, I wanna open it up to community safety working group members to share any work or anything they want to share that relates to this work. Ms. Ferreira. So um, we can start talking about this now and I'm sure we could probably talk about it more when we you know, kind of debrief and, and prepare for the finance uh, committee meeting tomorrow. But um, I was able to attend um, the meeting that Allegra Clark um, had sent in regards to the domestic violence advocates. Um, and thank you, Allegra, for, for sending that. That was very, very beneficial, actually. It was excellent. Um, basically, it was like a group of advocates from Jane Doe and other, other organizations and they actually had like these questions and everyone kind of got to talk. And I basically, you know, talked to them and let them know, you know, what's going on in Amherst and what we're doing. And obviously the questions that have come up around domestic violence. And um, they are very, very supportive of an alternative to policing. Um, they basically said that, you know, uh, most of them said that, you know, in terms of survivors having to deal with the police has not worked, is not working. Um, that survivors do want uh, an alternative 
to um, having to go to police, especially like some of them even brought up a uh, example of having to go to the police for protective orders and things like that. You know, they, they were saying that a lot of times they're very uncomfortable and going to police uh, for those things. Um, you know, and they kind of explained it that, you know, in terms of domestic violence, obviously there's the before, there's a lot going on beforehand. There's that instance, right, when they need help and assistance and then possibly the only avenue they have is to call the police. And then there's the afterwards. Right. So they said that obviously there's there's uh, you know, it's there's a line of, of places where they really need assistance. So I, I talked about our recommendations in terms of the recommendations for, you know, the the um, cultural center and the youth empowerment and everything else. They were very excited about that because I said it would be case management. They would be looking at other things. And they said, yes, you know, we want to deal with a lot of of the root issues. Um, and then they discuss in terms of the actual responders. Um, and they basically said that one of the things that would be important would be to give the responders training on the domestic violence, how to interact, how to de-escalate, how to support, how to really assist, um, as opposed to having an advocate go with the team, let's say, or something like that. They said that that could be part of the training that is giving to the community responders, when they're getting all the training around the escalation and everything else, they said that that, that could be something that could also be provided. Um, let me see what else we're talking about. You know, some of them were saying, because a lot of them were from like east, eastern part of Massachusetts. And so um, some of them were saying that they were going through some of the same um, processes that we are. Like, for instance, one area uh, there's actually two proposals happening. There's a proposal from the, the, the police department and there's a proposal from like a, a group similar to us, right? That's majority BIPOC people who are asking for a program that is separate. And then the police department is asking for a program that's within the police department. Um, and so one of the advocates said, the thing that we want, might wanna think about is that, you know, some police might be petty and stuff that if, if we do create a program that is separate than the police department, they might then, if, if let's say um, our community responders do need assistance, right? If something potentially were, were to become violent and they need to call the police, they might not respond, you know? Or some of them have said that there's been some police districts that, that are going down the road of having alternative uh, community responders. And what they've done, they've kind of cut out their DV program that they have in the police department in terms of being petty and stuff like that. So they said, you know, just to kind of, you know, watch out for some of those things. Uh, the other thing too, that was interesting that they shared and it's part of, I think if you go into that link, it should be in there, was that, you know, we are talking a lot about the, uh, you know, the HOOTS program, obviously it being over 30, 30 years in, in place. And there was this NPR interview. I don't know if you all have seen it. It was CAHOOTS, How Social Workers and Police Share Responsibilities in Eugene, Oregon. And it was a um, uh, interview with Ari Shapiro uh, with, you know, the folks that are running the CAHOOTS program out there. And it was very informative, you know, and basically um, Shapiro asking, you know, Ben, who's like the, one of the main people, well, how do you know, how do you go in there? You know, what do you go in there with? Uh, since you don't have a gun, you don't have this. He was like, well, I go in there with my training. I go in there with de-escalation training. I go in there with my crisis training. Um, and they basically said that last year, because obviously, as you know, it's, it's uh, Eugene and Springfield. They said they had about 24,000 calls and only in 150 calls did they have to call for police backup. And all those other calls, they did not have to call for police backup. And they said, and then um, Ari asked, well, what was an example in terms of where you had to call police? And they were like, basically it's in terms of um, when someone is gonna hurt themselves or possibly you know, hurt others, you know? but usually he's saying they're able to deescalate de uh, the situation. Um, and then there was another staff person who also said that the, and she said, in 30 years, we've never had a serious injury or a death that our team was responsible for in regards to the, the community responders uh, program. So um, one of the advocates even went so far to say, listen, this is not working. You know, with the, with the police, it's not working. We need to try something different. Survivors are not being helped out uh, um, at, as, as what, you know, it, it's being put out there that the, that, that survivors are being uh, better served with the police department. 
And she said, you know, alternative needs to be um, tried. Uh, something new needs to happen because right now the system is broken, you know? Um, so, you know, and they basically were like, oh, thank you so much for joining because obviously I was kind of like, not necessarily, even though as you all know, I've, I'm, I was a time nine coordinator. I dealt a lot with, you know, assisting uh, folks at, at UMass with um, sexual, around sexual violence, domestic violence and all that. So I have the background. Um, but uh, but obviously I was coming in from a different point of view, but they were very excited to have me. They were like, can you come back again? Because they meet every month and everything. And they were very excited. They were like, hats off to you all for, for the work that you all are doing. That's so awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for going. Um, I wasn't able to make it and I was caught really off guard by um, council, mem um, council members Steinberg, I think it was, by that yeah. comment around domestic violence. I remember way back, like probably like two months into her work, there was like a safe passage workshop and the facilitator there said that usually things get worse once the police get involved. So mm -hmm. that, yeah. And this was like, maybe they had probably around eight to 10 advocates from, you know, most of them from like the Jane Doe, but from other, um, and, and they were all kind of like either wanting to know more about alternative responders or most of them saying, yes, we need to try something new <laughs> to help survivors because what's happening now is not ha ha um, helping survivors. And there, a lot of them are from like, you know, I, I heard one saying Quincy, Cambridge, you know, like big, big places, which we know they're dealing with a lot of probably a lot more violence, you know, a violent situation. And they're just kind of like, no, we need something different. Definitely. Thank you so much for attending, Ms. Ferreira, and also reporting that information back. That's very helpful. Um, did anybody else have something they wanted to report to the group related to our work? Okay, um, I guess we can move straight into our discussion on debriefing the town council meeting on Monday. Um, First, I just wanna thank all of the members of the CSWG for all your work that went into the final report for part A. I was really excited to um, share the leadership with Ms. Walker and present our recommendations. And I really appreciate everyone's work. I know that this work has been super time consuming, triggering, exhausting, and we've been meeting so much. <laughs> so I just wanna throw that out there and thank you all. And we can get the conversation going. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Ferreira. Well, I just want to say, I think our two co-chairs were fantastic. You were, did us proud throughout the entire meeting. Uh, I just felt honored to be part of a group that the two of you were uh, leading and playing that role um, with the town council. I thought it was just great. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Mr. Vernon Jones just, you know, took the words out of my mouth. I mean, you all were just spectacular, you know, um, just on point. The presentation was on point. You covered it. It was very thorough from beginning to end. You went into particulars, into specifics, um, very informative. You didn't leave a lot of area for like, you know, questions because you covered it. Um, you know, I want to say that, you know, obviously I have a lot of community members, so they were all texting me about the two of you. Just let me, let me tell you, they want to invite you all to like go speak at different events and everything, because obviously the other part is that, you know, you all are leaders and, and you're showing the way, you know, for a lot of other, you know, uh, younger voices and youth voices and things like that, the, the younger generation. And so, um, everyone was very, very excited. They were just like, Thank goodness you all are, are showing. They were like CSWG is showing the way to to really do things, you know. So my hats off to the two of you. You all are just fabulous. Oh, thank you so much. You're making me turn red. <laughs> Um, I thought the presentation also went really well. I thought um, some of the council this council members' questions were a little bit um, off base, and I tried my best to try to bring them back to our cause. I'm a little bit confused by the email that our group got just a little bit before this meeting regarding the meeting for the finance committee. Did you all get a chance to read that yet? I, I want to say something before we dive into that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So first of all, I want to thank everybody um, for, was it yesterday or Monday's uh, meeting? I thought the co-chairs, you guys, I don't want to repeat what everybody else have said, 
me too. I got a lot of uh, text messages from my network. You know, everybody is proud of, of you guys. You guys are our, you know, fu uh, future leaders. Your leaders are ready. And also, especially to seven Gen. I remember on Sunday night, you know, um, Brianna, you were late, uh, up late, <laughs> you know, doing the, the last minute, you know, touches and, you know, yeah, and Alicia Sunday night and to Mr. You know, uh, Rosman and Jones and Deborah, you know, the work you guys put in over the weekend, even though you wanted to go away. I mean, it's all teamwork. Seven Gen, you know, I can't stress enough how lucky we have we, we are to have local firm organization do this work for us because the amount of time and expertise and wisdom they brought to their work is, you know, uh, um, it's, it's really impressive. I just want to put that out. In terms of my impression at the, at the meeting on Monday, I think it's same old, same old. Nothing much has changed, um, such as excuses. You know, when BIPOC folks are, you know, whether you call it special education issues or whatever, or discipline gap or um, academic year, <laughs> Achievement, it's always, you know, give it time, transition is hard, excuse upon excuses upon excuse. That's what I heard on Monday. I also heard um, money, 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 money is too much, it's too much. But nobody is talking about one point something million for MS Town Common renovation. Nobody is talking about huge capital projects on Jones Library and other projects. Nobody talked about overpaid over time for police officers. Most of them make more than $100,000. But the focus on Monday is how are we going to pay for this? Uh, overlapping of services and all that crap. I'm sorry, but you know, just to have one person have so much power. Um, Andy Stember is a member of town council and also the chair of our finance committee. It's, it's not good to have very few people have so much incredible amount of power. It really worries me. I will stop. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I just wanted to appreciate one other thing about your presentation. I thought you seamlessly wove together things from our report, things from the 7 Gen report, things from the detail memo, things that came from other places and articles. That the way you wove all that together, I just thought was magnificent. Um, and I thought other members played a good role too, and I particularly appreciated Ms. Pat's uh, statement at, toward the very end of the meeting, really explaining, uh, backing Brianna up and explaining why it's an exercise of white supremacy to limit the amount of time um, that was available for our agenda and public comment. Thank you, you're so kind. <laughs> Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the thing too that I heard from my network is just that people were just really impressed with with all of us, you know, at the end of the day and with this group, uh, and the fact that we're, you know, it's a team effort, you know, at the end of the day, even though we had the two leaders kind of leading the way and guiding uh, uh, everything, but we all, you know, chimed in. We all did what we needed to do at different points um, to a very kind of difficult process right because again my my question and the question that I've been putting out there and even like I know like you know Irv Rose which is a friend of mine who sent that that uh, mm -hmm. message there me and him had been kind of communicating back and forth on social media because it's kind of like you know why why did you uh, charge us to come up with recommendations when now you are trying to basically kind of break down those recommendations not out of funding. I mean, then then the charge should have been, listen, create something that we want you to create, and these are the parameters, and this is the funding that we have for it. You know, that should have been our charge then, you know? It can't be, here's the charge, you have these two 
these two specific areas you need to focus on. And we hit all of that. And then, you know, in terms of looking and researching and going to all the meetings and all of that, and then look at these two specific areas. And then we met, you know, obviously we've done the part A and now we have the part B. We've met part A and now you're basically saying, well, we don't have the money for it or this is not what we asked for, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. Um, you know, it's really, you know, very disturbing. But again, you know, we're going to have to, of course, respond, you know, to, to these questions. We're going to have to continue because obviously, you know, our residents of, of Amherst, all residents of Amherst, not just the few that get supported and get protected, all residents of Amherst need our work and need us to, to press forward. So we are going to, you know, obviously, talk more in detail in terms of some of these questions, but it is frustrating, you know, nonetheless, uh, the amount of um, just resistance, because again, you know, our charge wasn't create something that we already know. No, what we already know is not working. We have to create something new. I understand that creating something new, it brings up a lot of fear and people are afraid, right? They're afraid of what is new. I get that. But that's why we needed to create something that was new. You can't create the same thing because the same, as I said, when I, when I spoke with my opening kind of sentiments was you, you do the same thing as you all have heard, right? It's the definition of insanity. You're doing the same thing, you're getting the same results. So why would we create the same thing? So anyway, I'll stop there for now. Absolutely. And I tried to amplify, I, oh, Ms. Pat, do you want to go for oh, no, Go ahead, go ahead. I tried to amplify in the presentation that it's really important that the specific the specifics that we worked out as a group need to be brought to life with the recommendations because I don't want them to use vague ideas when we've spent so much time being specific on what needs to happen for the programs to be successful. And I don't I'm also not okay with our recommendations being halfway funded and then we're, we're going to be given um, markers to evaluate the success of programs that aren't fully funded. I don't that doesn't sit right with me. Um, Ms. Pat, did you want to go? Sure. So uh, you raised uh, the issue of the email that we, group email we got today from our roads. You know, I've, I've known him for a while in this town. And um, what I can say is that I am known for calling people out um, at the right time. I did that a lot um, at the school system with special education. I raised uh, white supremacy issues and how, you know, kids of color, BIPOC kids don't get as much services uh, who, need, who need it as compared to um, affluent families. I raised the same awareness. I called out the business community and I'm calling out our road tonight because the, his email is very divisive. Yeah. I will encourage him to actually go back and read the work we've done. And I thank him for his services to this town. However, I know his record and I'm not attacking him as a person, but I know his record when he was a school committee member. As a, as a black man, I'm a black woman. I couldn't go to him and say, these are you know, issues I would like you to push for school committee because his record when he was in school committee was to follow the status quo, the political establishment in this town, including the business community. So, Am I surprised about the letter? No. Am I frustrated? Absolutely. Am I disappointed? Yes. That's what I'm saying. But you know, that's his track track record. That is his track record. Not to say that you know he has done some good work in black community, but um, he's a man of privilege. Let's put it this way. Even though he's black, so I'm calling him out tonight. I don't have anything against him. I've known him for a long time. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very frustrated. And I did send an email, a group email to, to the black community, uh, the reparation group, 
just express the way I feel. I'll let other people speak. Uh, Ms. Pereira. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just like Ms. Pat, I just think it's divisive. And then like I said, you know, Irv and I, we were kind of going back and forth on social media. And then at some point I just was like, okay, you know, I'm not gonna keep on going back and forth on it because I think it's just futile, right? Um, but that was my sentiment too, is that, you know, you know, we don't need to be divisive, right? Um, if you do have kind of issues with, with certain things, it's kind of like, you know, just come and talk to us, you know, and let's, let's work it out as opposed to kind of posting it all on here and, and sharing it with everyone in this way. It just, it just feels, you know, very, you know, frustrating again, because, you know, we, we, we want to get kind of feedback, right. To be able to make this even better a program, but not in terms of just kind of like wholeheartedly saying, no, I don't, you know, I don't agree with this, or I don't agree with that. I mean, that's, that's just very frustrating. And with her, you know, I've known him for many years and everything, and actually he did help my son out um, with a, a situation that he was dealing with, with in Fort River, and I was very grateful to him for that. Um, and and I, like you said, Ms. Pat, I don't have anything against him in terms of personally, but it's, it's in terms of this, right? This is something that we're trying to, we know it's something new. We know people are very afraid to take this step forward. So we don't need to be divisive, right? We, what we need is kind of like, okay, you have questions, you have, you have issues, come talk to us. But kind of blasting us in, in this way is a little bit, you know, disconsorting to me. I'm you. No. Okay. <laughs> Did anybody else have any more comments on the, um, the town council meeting or on the email we received? I think the co-chair should respond to our roads. Okay, I can respond. You know, that's my suggestion to respond and copy to all the people that he copied. I, I will definitely respond or Ms. Walker, um, Ms. Freer, I see your hand. I'm just saying, and if you want us to kind of, um, if you want to do a draft and then share with us and then we can just, you know, like we usually do, just back any feedback and stuff. Because I think, yeah, you know, the coaches should respond, but I think it should come, it should be a team response. You know what I'm saying? From all of us so that he knows that as, as it's been always, like that we're all, we're a team, you know, we all speak as one. And, you know, he's a community He's a community black leader in this town. And you know, his words does matter. Mm -hmm. And so we do need to respond to it. It's not just like random people, you know, that you know that wrote the email. So it's serious and we should take it seriously and we need to respond to it. Mm -hmm. ASAP. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, I've I've known her for a long time and I've valued some things he do, he's done, and I've had some strong disagreements with him on some other things. Uh, I think writing is important at this point because we don't want Irv giving cover to town council members who, um, you know, aren't, don't want to step up and support what we're proposing. Um, and I think this is the group that has studied the issue. Uh, frankly, as far as I can tell, in a way that that Herb Rhodes has not. Uh, and I think that's the, the purpose of writing is partly to help everybody who got that letter understand uh, that really at this point, the expertise on these issues lies in this group um, more than anywhere else. Yeah, I definitely wish that he came to just the community safety working group and didn't Put, put kind of put us on blast with like the town council president and I saw Sh Shalini was on that email too. Um, that's the only reason that I felt it was a little bit divisive. I was opening it like, okay, but yeah, we can definitely work on a draft and I can try to finish that this evening and send share it to all of you guys for um, feedback to respond. Cause I definitely want to respond and I just want to continue to make the community safety working group something where people feel like they can come in and participate during public comment and I feel like he should have been a part of our work or come to public comment or something like that before writing such an email because I haven't seen him at any of our meetings so that's why I felt a little bit out of line. Miss Pat? I just want to say to Mr. Ross it took a lot of courage for you to make this comment 
being a white man and you know speaking true to the power i know it's not you know it's not easy for you so i just want to acknowledge that thank you thanks miss Ferreira. yeah and actually for me that was the thing so it was it was like different so all the emails because some of the emails i didn't even know who they were you know but i, I could recognize some of it but most of them were all uh, uh, council members then is that it all the rest yeah. all council members yeah so that's yeah that's it's not good. <laughs> so oh, it's, not, it's not good. Yeah. So another thing I want to, to discuss, and then we can, you know, I won't take too much uh, people's time, and then we can um, talk about tomorrow. Is I also want to call out the local media, the Gazette, the article that they 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 printed for the Monday meeting. The content itself is not bad, but the the um. The title of it, again, I see white supremacy in it. You know, it's focused, you know, if you, if you didn't read the article, you think it's only about money. So I didn't like that. Um, so I wanted to call that out as well. You know, and I don't expect anybody to say anything, but, um, you know, some of us subscribe to um, Gazette. Some of us do business with them. And if they can't cover stories uh, in a balanced way. They're doing the service to the community. Um, I've never read in, in Gazette where they say, you know, they, they criticize um, highly paid administrators in this town or criticize, you know, um, um, capital uh, projects or anything, you know, uh, that benefits mostly white folks or whatever. And then the caption for Monday meeting about our, our group is money, like that. I don't like that. So I want to call that out. I did call um, Scott, but um, I haven't got, you know, he hasn't got it back to me yet, the, the reporter. I just want to put that out as well. I didn't read the article yet, but I am looking at the title now and it says, um, for those of you who haven't read it yet, it says Amher Safety Group plans to plans run into millions. Wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, you know, that, that's, that's the caption. Yeah, because, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, uh, just, I don't know for sure how things go at the Gazette, but I know on many newspapers, the reporters who write the articles do not write the headlines. Um, so our, I mean, I, I don't know how that headline came about. I think it's, I think it's objectionable, um, but it may be the editor, not the, not the reporter. That's true. That's what my, you know, that's what some people, because um, among the BIPOC community today, there have been text messages all over the place about this particular title. And my understanding is that the report, you know, reporters can write stuff, but the editor gets to make you know, final decision as to what the title is. So perhaps we may want to um, do a public uh, service announcement or something like that to counteract the, the headline, um, something like that. That's, at least that's what I, I'm hearing. That's the chattering I'm hearing in the community that CSWG that we need to put out something in the paper to counteract that. I don't know how people feel about that. One thing that, oh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, are, are we ready to go on to the finance committee meeting? Because I wanted to raise a question. You know, last Thursday, I guess the 20th, the town manager sent us an email that said, I have assembled a staff team to address each of your recommendations and we will be prepared to present our thoughts at the finance committee meeting on May, Thursday, May, Thursday, May 27th. For instance, we are working on having an implementation plan with a timeline, milestones, budget for initiating a computer responder program in FY22, hopefully by January 1. I will, of course, share what we have developed with the members of the working group. So this sounds like he's going to present a new budget tomorrow night, and we don't know anything about it. That This does not seem like a, a good procedure. And I, I, our, 
I'm wondering, do we want to see whether he's able to join us tonight, uh, give us some sense of what, what he's planning? I thought he was on the invite for this evening's meeting, because th that was my question, too. Ms. Walker and I have both asked him and followed up with him on whether what his action plan was. Since ever since the $130,000 was designated for Crest, like what is your action plan? And we haven't heard back. So his comments tomorrow have come as a surprise to all of us. Um, Ms. Ferreira, I see your hand up. Yeah, so I guess, can we just finish what Ms. Pat has said yeah. though, before we, because I think that the right. other question is just gonna go into tomorrow's meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we need to talk about, but I just wanted to finish what Ms. Pat said because I didn't, I hadn't read the, the article and now that you, you know, kind of stated that headline and everything, yeah, that is very troubling. So, and I don't know what the protocol is, um, but it would be good for us to kind of do a response to um, the Gazette or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what the protocol is, but. Yeah, the, the article itself, I'm okay with that. It's neutral. Mm -hmm. That's oh, okay. It's not bad. Okay, so the article is okay. It was just the headline. Exactly. Gotcha. People, you know, we live in a, in an age of so much bombardment of information. Sometimes people just, you know, read headlines and move on. Yeah. Um, so that's that's my concern. Yeah. Well, Miss Pat, you already have a call out to the to the person, right? Yeah. yeah. And I do have a relationship with him, so I um I called him up, you know, but he hasn't called me back yet. Can you uh, get more information from him, and then and then once you know more, then you can share it with us, and then we can mm -hmm. see what to yeah. do at that point. Mm -hmm. Are you all right. good with that? Okay. Definitely. Good. good, but thank you for bringing it up this time. Yeah. So now on to the finance committee, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit confused about what, what his plan is going to be. I just got Lynn's email a couple minutes before this meeting started and their agenda is again, I, and I don't know it, I'm just going to read it. It says budget review, community services, social services, community responder program. So it looked in, in their agenda, there's no place for us to do the presentation. It just says, um, CSWG questions and discussions. Athena will bring in the entire committee as panelists. Since you will have a quorum, uh, Andy will ask you guys to call a meeting to order. Can you see the email? Yeah. Ms. I Ferrer. mean, I, I saw the email, but I didn't read it yet. Do you want me to keep it up or do you want me to? I, I don't know how to make this bigger here. So it sounds like she's giving them your presentation ahead of time for them to review. Oh, okay. And then they, you will be, and it says, uh, the, the town manager will go first and then the council will ask questions and have discussions and then CSWG questions and discussions. And that's when she's saying that you guys will be brought in. You should call the meeting. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't sound like you will be yeah, so that's what I'm a little bit confused about because I had been in conversation with Lynn since last week and I told I let her know that we were going to present all of our recommendations to the finance committee because we wanted all of our recommendations to be a part of the budget. And she said that she didn't respond directly to that, but now I'm looking at the agenda and we're it doesn't look like we're presenting anything. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. I think Ms. Ms. Walker had her hand up too. Oh, I don't know if you wanted Ms. to Walker. First, I'm sorry. I'll no, sorry, I apologize. I'm kind of being mobile around my house right now because of my children and the noise. Um, but I also was feeling a little bit confused about what the plan for tomorrow night was because my initial understanding was that when we had originally planned to go to the first finance committee meeting on the budget and on the um, public safety section of the budget, we were instructed specifically by the chair of the town council that it would not be in our benefit to attend that meeting because we wouldn't be given time to talk and so that they would be interested in setting up a meeting where we could actually have time um, and that that was going to be this meeting and so I thought this meeting was going to be a little bit more focused on us and what we had to say and our time to make our presentation and I also thought that we had said that we were going to do a slightly different presentation than what we gave to the town council. And so I'm a little bit confused as to which 
slideshow they gave them because if it was the one from the town council meeting, one, it doesn't have all of the language on the slides. We used mostly visuals. And so they'd be missing a lot of the information. And we also had additional information specifically geared towards the budget that we wanted to present to the finance committee that is not on the slides that we used for the town council. Um, and so it's just a little bit hard to sort this when we get emails like this the day before. So I'm not exactly sure um, what course of action we should take about that. Uh, Ms. Ferreira and then Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I think that's that's my kind of questions too, because I think in terms of like doing the whole presentation, I'm assuming that these, because the whole town council is going to be there and I, I'm assuming they were there um, on Monday. So I don't necessarily think we needed to do that, but like what Ms. Uh, Walker saying, what Alicia's saying in terms of kind of having a, a pointed um, presentation really focused on more of the, the financial uh, reasoning as to why we we made the decisions that we did around the community responder, I think would be what I was um, you know, more interested in. And then also um, Mr. Vernon Jones and I had kind of looked at more of the details and stuff and maybe you know, interweaving some of that information. Um, I think that's what I would want to, but now I guess what, and, and Ms. Moisten, you're here, since Mr. Bachman's not here, I guess that's my question is, so now what do we do, you know, because they are not going to have the information necessary. And so what they're going to do is bombard us with in, in questions that we could have already resolved with, you know, sending them documentation. Um, I'm going to say yeah. that you guys need to go and do and present what you're, you were thinking of presenting. I think that's the best way for me to say that. It seems a little bit, I don't, I, like, you know. It seems like you guys need to go and present what you wanted to present. And as soon as you have the time to speak, Brianna, you should call it out for what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's um, the most I can say about it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones, Ms. Walker, and then Ms. Pat. Yeah, I think we should be aware, as I understand it, all of the voting members of the Finance Committee are members of the Town Council. And they were all at the meeting Monday night. Uh, so anybody who has a vote on the finance committee has already heard our presentation. Um, but I think Ms. Moisten is exactly right. I think we, we need to figure out what beyond the presentation we've done, we want to say to them uh, and plan to say it um, as soon as we have an opportunity to say anything. Uh, Ms. Walker, Ms. Pat, and then Ms. Ferreira. Um, yes, uh, so I also agree with Ms. Moisten and that was that were my thoughts on it also that I think we should just present when it is our time. Uh, Brianna and I had already begun working on a condensed presentation. So basically what our plan was, it's not completely finished yet, but was to eliminate or reduce most of the historical context slides um, and then just to do the recommendations, but adding one slide for each recommendation with specifics on the budget that come directly from the document that Russ and Deborah created um, so that they have specifics as to where we got our numbers from and we can do a little bit more explaining. So that was the plan there. And, and I think if everybody is okay with that, I think we should just continue to present that when we are giving them the time to speak. I just don't know how much time they're going to allow us to have. Um, Ms. Pat and then Ms. Ferreira, and then I see Ms. Bowman's hand is up also. Okay. In addition to doing a condensed brief presentation, I would like to recommend that we start with, um, if they ask question or if we're doing presentation, we start with the ones that they don't want to listen to. And that is the BIPOC Cultural Center and also the Youth Empowerment Program. We start with that and then let them know that the CREST program will be our last presentation. So they wanna control what we wanna to present tomorrow. Uh -uh. We need to tell them they charged us to do this. We need to fully present in terms of budget item, line item, whatever, tomorrow. 
And if both of you are stuck at some point, I'm happy to help out because I, you know, participated in creating the budget. And we, you know, we use a combination of comparative uh, salaries in town of similar positions and the average with Indeed uh, website and other places. So I'm happy to help out tomorrow if they have specific questions on budget uh, line item is what I want to say. But we definitely need to start with those other two and then work our way say, oh, I know they're going to ask for like, why do we want to pay people 10, 10K for, you know, things like that. So I think we already responded on that on Monday that I will shut up. Yeah. Miss um, Ferreira and then Miss Bowman. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think like what Ms. Pat was saying, I think we all, you know, you all will be again, you know, the co-chairs to kind of, you know, go through the presentation, we can chime in and help, you know, wherever you all need help, we can all chime in. And I think we all need to kind of, you know, jump in and assist, you know, throughout the, the, the whole process as we did, you know, on Monday. Uh, the other thing too, is that, and Ms. Pat and, and, um, and Brianna, Ms. Owen, you all brought up that, that point. It's just like, this is a critical meeting tomorrow, right? It's around the budget. It's around everything that, that we've been getting a lot of resistance on. So we need to take the time, you know? We need to make sure we do all recommendations. Because remember, I, I, I made that question at the end. And I think you said, Brianna, that you also asked that question. And it's been crickets, right? Silence. No one's responding. So my thing is, when it's our time, we use the time to present all our recommendations. And we present everything in terms of the budget because it's gonna be on them as to why they're trying to, to put that to the side, right? And then the other thing is that to bring it up, it's like, we take up as much time as we want, you know? I'm sorry, they're gonna to have to listen to us. And then also in terms of public comment, if they try to limit public comment, again, we need to make sure that they, they, they extend the public comment so we have the time, because this is important. It can't be about us, you know, curbing and, and, and no, that's not gonna happen because that's what happened the other time. And, I, and for me, that's strategic, right? Because a lot of public comment has been, has been in favor of us. So basically by limiting it to 15 minutes, you're not really getting the, the, the breadth of, of people that are in support of, of, of doing this and spending this amount because they think it's a priority, it's a value and that we need to do it. Um, one last thing was in terms of, I, I got some questions, like some, some folks from the net, my network were like, oh, so yeah, um, you know, and, and in, the, in terms of the reduction of the police, and that's gonna happen right away. And I was like, no, actually, no. So I think we wanna make that clear that what we said is no more, you don't, we're not gonna, you're not gonna fill your vacancies. You're not gonna hire any of the police, but actually we didn't even say for the first fiscal year to cut the police. You know what I'm saying? So I think that needs to be clear because I think that's already, you know, because obviously we don't even have the, the program in place. So why would we say to cut the police right now? That would make no sense, right? But we need to make that clear because I think that's getting people very afraid, you know, like, oh my God, the police are going to be gone tomorrow. That is not what we said. We just said no more hires <laughs> and no, no filling of vacancies. And obviously we have to put the program in place, right? In terms of CRESS. Um, so I think we want to, to weave that in and make that very uh, crystal clear. I agree with, um, I agree with you and Ms. Pat. Um, I see uh, Ms. Bowman has her hand up. So first of all, I want to apologize for missing the meeting Monday. Um, I just have a ton of things happening right now at once. Um, but that being said, um, I so I agree. I absolutely agree with pre presenting the um, the budgets. You know, the budget side of it, explanation right off the rip. Um, I think that we should absolutely, I totally agree with absolutely not backing down and allowing them to quiet us. Um, and I, be, I really believe that if they quiet, if they do quiet us, because obviously, you know, they, you know, there may be there may be that possibility where they where they're you know able to do that. Then I feel like 
um, we need to get back together and go go to like create a letter to go to the media and just call it for what it is if we do get quieted and to be like, look, this is what our budget was. This is what we're asking for. This is why we're asking for it. And we were silenced at the budget meeting that we were supposed to be able to present at. Um, it is very strategic what is going on and what is um, what they're doing. Um, one of the things that um, I had mentioned um, to Alicia, and I don't know if she got a chance to say anything, is has anybody had a chance to look up other activities, programs, whatever that the town has made budget for and that were not BIPOC, you know, BIPOC um, led issues? And if so, you know, how much pushback did they get and how much money did they ultimately get? Because I have this really deep seated feeling that there has been other things that have been requested that the town council has not pushed back against. Um, I think everybody in this group is well aware of why we're getting pushed back. Um, and I just wanted to kind of like put that out there to like, <clears throat> excuse me, put that out there to really think about that because of the fact that it's like, one of the easiest, one of the one of the um, easiest ways to put them on blast is to be like, okay, and I'm I'm using this as an example, but the library is asking for such and such gazillion dollars, you know, and I I know they're getting they're they're having to sign petitions, do all this stuff, but like at the same time, like how much resistance are they really getting? How much, what is, what is, how much, what is really being questioned? You know what I'm saying? So I just want, I don't know like where to even start looking for this information, but um, I think it's something that we should, you know, if we can find it read kind of easily, it should be considered because I, I really feel like they've given money to other programs and not given as much pushback as they've given to us, especially considering the amount of work that we have all put into this. So I, I just really wanted to, I just wanted to say that. So, um, and I'm also actually very disappointed in Mr. Rhodes. So I wanted to put that out there too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, Ms. Pat and then Ms. Moyston. I was just going to say, um, quick example I can think of, and I did review the whole budget uh, that is being proposed by the town manager will be the, you know, uh, the town is going to be paying for um, an economic development director. That's going to benefit BID, B-I-D, um, and, and the BID uh, membership are, more, are all white landowners and landlords. Why do we need to spend money to create such a position? We don't need it. Another quick example is golf course that we maintain and pay people actually to, to maintain the golf. Who, who, who uses that? It's affluent people, mostly white folks. And nobody's raising any issues around that. That's just, you know. And then, you know, we have white admit, as administrators who are overly, you know, overpaid in this town. Nobody's raising those issues. So, Sashina, I hope that helps. The superintendent, all of them, they are being overpaid, and you know nobody's saying anything. And then you know people are, are, are raising eyebrow because Bipoc has made you know recommendations. One thing also the coaches or anybody can say tomorrow is when you start a program, it costs a startup costs more money. There are some costs that is one time thing, and I think of the two vans, for example. Um, electronic equipment, setting up, you know, offices and, you know, you, you know, uniform or whatever, but it's not, it's not like we're going to, some of those costs will go away after, you know, the program, you know, start, you know, and up and running and things like that. So they should bear that in mind as well. Um, thank you, Ms. Pat. Ms. Moyston and then Ms. Ferreira. 
I was actually going to say that Miss Pat is probably the person to find out about the money um, in regards to what Tashina Miss Bowman was talking about, like the different projects that are being sponsored for um, or that they're not getting pushed back. And I just have to stress that you just you're going to have to just keep calling them out if they do try to quiet and you have to really stress that you need all of the everything that you recommended you rec recommended for a reason and that was to get it's it's to make the movement happen and you while the crest will do a lot you need all of the different all of the other recommendations to back that to make it all you know so the overall goal is, goal is equity here right and so that's that is the piece that you need to like really stress to them is that it's you know it is about safety and alternatives but it's about equity too and so that is there's a lot to be said there and you just have to keep calling them out because this yeah it's pretty much what they everybody else has said. Thank you, Ms. Moisten. Uh, Ms. Ferreira and then Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, um, it, just in terms of what Ms. Moisten just said, you know, when I spoke with the DV advocates yesterday, that's exactly what they were very excited about was that, you know, we were comprehensive, right? In terms of making recommendations that were preventative, because first and foremost, we don't wanna to have, to have to respond, right? We want incidents to, 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 to decrease and things like that. But also having something in place, of course, to, to be responsive, but something that is going to be you know, equitable and fair for everybody. Um, and so this is something that I think we wanna stress. And then my thing is, Ms. Pat, I know that you have probably like I, I know you have more expertise than me in terms of budgets and things like that so I don't know if maybe you know how you might want to strategize with um, Miss Owen and Miss Alicia Walker to kind of maybe have a, a part to play actually in the presentation you know to kind of break down some of the, the budget because you you were very crucial in creating it um, so anyway that would be my recommendation so that then we, we're very um, seamless too you know, as opposed to, well, you have a question. I think we want to head them and like head a lot of the questions that we can. And then whatever other questions they have, obviously, then then, then we answer them as, as, as they come up in terms of one-offs. Um, and then lastly, I know it was brought up, um, Mr. Vernon Jones had brought that up earlier about, about Paul Bachelman. So yeah, where is this copy of what he's presenting tomorrow? What is going on with that? I mean, I, I, I really don't get it. Um, since Mr. Bachman was part of our meetings for this past month, since November, why wouldn't he share what he's presenting tomorrow so that we have a heads up so that we know, you know, how to respond. So can anyone kind of also <laughs> tell me some information about that? <laughs> I have no idea. You know, that really worries me. Um, if you know, he didn't extend courtesy for us to at least review what he's going to be presenting tomorrow. It's, the whole thing is making me suspicious. Oh, um, Mr. Vernon Jones, I, I thought I saw your hand up and I also see Ms. Walker's hand up. Yeah. Um, right. Ms. Moisten, is there any possibility of contacting the town manager now with that question? I already did. Um, so, I have an email that says the finance committee meeting is to review the town manager's budget line item and I will be addressing the items that the CSWG prepared in its recommendations and I that doesn't still really tell me what that means so um, but I have sent him a text and this this email came to me on Tuesday so now I'm sending him a, a text about like a where are you and um, B, uh, they have questions so. Thank you. If he's available, it'd be good if you could jump on. Yeah. I wanted to go back to the question of the reduction in the number of police officers. Um, my guess is that most of the town councilors are not aware that the town manager's proposal increases the number of police officers over the number currently working. Mm -hmm. Since at least December and maybe earlier, there have been 44 uh, working sworn officers, um, even though the department's been budgeted at 48. So for him to budget 46 is an increase of two uh, at a time when we need to be decreasing the police department. 
we have recommended a decrease to 43 um, because we know there is another retirement expected. So this is a unique moment with an opportunity to reduce the department budget by five positions. Uh, and at a minimum, uh, we should get all, you know, we want all the money uh, from those five positions. But it does, you know, our proposals at this point do not call for any police officer to lose their job or be laid off or terminated. That may be necessary in the future, but not at this point. Our recommendation is to get the department down to 43 and keep it there, as Ms. Ferreira said, not filling vacancies um, from there forward. But I think most of the town councilors are not even aware that the budget they're looking at is an increase in the number of, of officers. Uh, and I think our request, our recommendation to go to 43 is a very reasonable uh, recommendation and needs to be, you know, made quite strongly in our presentation. Um, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones, uh, Ms. Walker, and then Ms. Pat. Um, thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones for that comment, because that was actually very helpful to lay it out like that. Um, and I think because I did hear a lot of town councilors um, in response that they're fully supportive of wanting to give us more funding and that they sound like, it sounds like these are great ideas and they're very interested in it, but then they also have the backhand. And um, I heard one counselor specifically say they didn't want to be responsible for like people losing their jobs. Right. And so I think something like that for her specifically to hear would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some other counselor members as well. Um, and then I also just wanted to earlier express my um the fact that I was also just a little bit uncomfortable with Mr. Bachelman having these discussions and committees set up outside of our committee to be discussing the things that our committee has been tasked to do and that we weren't even involved in the idea of that happening like he didn't bring up the idea like hey guys this is what I'm thinking of doing right now is that along the lines of what you guys were thinking or anything like that and I'm just now thinking about that so I just wanted to bring that up um because it's feeling really uncomfortable for me. One thing I okay. Oh, thank you, Ms. Walker. Ms. Pat? So one thing I wanna say is, I think everybody is, is you know, believing that 130K uh, came out of two frozen um, offices, um, but that's, that's not the way I say it. If you add on, I don't think an average police officer only makes 65K a year. That's impossible. They live on overtime. It did not include benefits, meaning, you know, employer, you know, town's um, portion of health care, retirement contribution, and all that, you know, all that, that comes with it. I, I look at 130K as one police officer position. We need to drill down to that. And I'm going to say it tomorrow. I don't want the public to feel, oh, the police officers are only making 65K a year and these people are recommending two point something million dollar program. That's not true. Um, so I don't know where, where the 130 is coming from for two police officers. That's impossible. I don't believe that. The, the, the facts don't support it because it, do, it does not include benefits. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if it, oh, did Ms. Fre Freire, were you gonna say something? Mm -hmm. oh, so I don't, I don't know whether it includes benefits, but I just, I, what I wanna say is that your new rookie make doesn't typically get the overtime right? The overtime typically goes to the people who have been there before. Um, I'm just trying to just give you the, the info, right? Uh, in theory, right? And typically, because it takes a while for them to get out. And I don't know about the benefits piece. And typically, the overtime that they get is from the detail policing. And the detail is paid for whoever is doing the work, right? So if there's construction on Route 9, 
and root and, and the state is doing that work, then typically it's the state. Now, often they do detail for us too. So, you know, it does, I'm not going to say it never comes from us, but that's typically how that works with the overtime with the police. And it is amazing how much they work, but typically how much they earn over a year, you know, it's a lot. Um, but often the newer police officers, the, the rookies, as they would call them, don't make that much and that 65,000, I don't know about the benefits piece is kind of close to what they get. Uh, Ms. Pat? So the point I'm trying to make is whoever the two officers were that retired, that left or whatever, I'm, I don't think they're rookies. No, so I, yeah. Yeah, I don't think they're rookies. My point is whatever salary they were making before they're no longer with the department, you know, should be what we should be talking about. I, right. And I thank you for the clarification. The second thing is, you know, benefits, and it should be, and I'm, you know, it's good for employees to have benefits, but it's not included in throwing a, around 130 for two police officers. My point is, if we add on benefits and years of experience of those officers that left, you're talking at, at least $200,000 or more. Is the point I'm trying to make. It's not just 130. Thank you. Yeah, I just didn't want him to kick it back and say that it's the rookies that, yeah. right? Because I think what he's trying to say is we're going to give you what we would have given these new police officers, right? The two positions that are being held. He's not thinking, not including the money that's going to come out of the folks that are going to retire. It's his point is that it's the two new rookies. Does that make sense? It, to makes your point. Sense, it would have been helpful to say it does not include benefits. Yeah. You know, it would have been helpful that if we add on benefit, we're talking about 200K for those positions. Yeah. Um, Ms. Bowman and, Ms. and then Mr. Vernon Jones, and then I have a comment. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about is like, that needs to be like, <clears throat> so the money that, Every time an officer retires, we should not be replacing them with a new, a rookie officer, first off. Second, I personally feel like the challenge would really be to the town is to look at what that officer retired at. Yep. And then bringing, and that be the amount that's, uh, that is going into into our organization, along with the fact that they're not hiring a new officer behind that, that officer that retired. And that's based on everything from the redlining that went on in Amherst to the fact that I can't walk into not one store in Amherst and not be in white spaces. That I cannot walk like, I, like Literally, I want to take the whole freaking town council and dump them into an area where they are the only, like not, and not together, individually. You are the only white person. You are the only white person. You are the only white person. You need to live here for a month and figure it out. And it's like, and that's like nothing. You know what I'm saying? Because then I think about it and I'm sorry, BIPOC people tend to embrace community and will be like, is not gonna let that person go and be left out. They're not gonna let that person go without. You know how many times I open my door to people? I don't have enough money. I don't have enough this, I don't have enough that, but you know what, we're gonna make this work. So you don't go hungry. So like, <laughs> the reason this is happening is because of the fact that none of these people are made to feel uncomfortable. None of those people are made to feel like they have to look at themselves in the mirror and look at what they are actually doing. Like my, I am teaching my children when they, when we drive through town and they see all these like Black Lives Matter sign. One of my, my actually it was funny. One of my friends said something real interesting to me. Huh, I don't see very many Black Lives Matter sign when I'm in a black neighborhood. It's performative. That's what it is. And my kids know it. They, I'm like, look, don't even look that way. It's performative. It's not like, okay, you put a sign, you put a sign out. What is that doing? We need to hold them accountable. We need to hold this whole community accountable. 
and and it's gonna be it's gonna be hard and nasty because people who have it and are have been maintaining it aren't gonna want to let it go so they're gonna do everything they can and undermined sideways way like get people like herb rose to say the thing that he said and not join the meeting and not be part of this but then to have some side comments to say they're, that's what they do. That's what that is literally what they do, and we need to be really aware of it. And we really need to, like, we need to not come out like, like all like soft and like, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, compassionate. I know this is uncomfortable for you. I no no no. We need to come out like, look, you are literally starving me from being human from being human, from feeling like I can go into a store and I'm not gonna be followed, feeling like I can like interact with somebody and not feel like you're gonna look down on me because you have no idea of what I'm going through. Like I'm, I'm, I just, I know, like I, I went, to, I didn't go to the, the meeting on Monday partially because I knew we had this meeting on Thursday and I, really like I'm, I'm tired of tiptoeing around well-meaning white people. I really am. Um, 30 years I've been here, tiptoeing around well-meaning white people and I'm just so done. And also the well-meaning black people are getting on my last two. You know, the ones that are like, let's just be peaceful. Let's just be like, look, I don't wanna be peaceful with you anymore because being peaceful with you has done damage to my family directly. Mm -hmm. Being peaceful with you has done damage to my community directly. And so like, we really need to go in there, guns a blazing, like, hey, we're, we're not going anywhere and we're gonna keep showing up and we're gonna keep making a ruckus and we're gonna keep putting on blast. And if you don't wanna hear us here, we're gonna go to the newspapers and we're gonna, you know, and make, we need to make a lot of noise surrounding this because these are programs that are constantly stripped from us in order to make room for college students to have apartments, for, for new, new pizza restaurants to open up, for bars to, to expand. It's at the expense of the community. And, and, and I'm not gonna say BIPOC community, it's at the expense of the community of Amherst. The people who are lower income, the people who are like not out there you know, with the set little, like, I don't have to work, I can just stay at home. The two parents who are working, the single moms, the like single dads, this, these community, this, the Crest program, the community, the community center, all that stuff is gonna, uh, is gonna directly affect the community of Amherst that doesn't have a voice. And we gotta fight for them. We really do. We gotta fight for us. And I'm just like, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm so scared. I'm scared because I'm, I've seen it happen where we get shut down and I just don't wanna see us get shut down tomorrow because I just, I, I don't have any more faith in this community. Like as far as, you know, like people, people, the white people in this community. And I'm gonna say, Mr. Vernon Jones, I told you before, I consider you a co-conspirator. You, you're there, you're doing the work. That's what, that is what an ally looks like. You know what I'm saying? Like you're out there doing the work. You're speaking to the people you need to speak to. You're not trying to elicit things out of people of BIPOC, the BIPOC, BIPOC community to, you know, to further any agenda, it's like, no, we gotta take responsibility for what our community has done to, to the BIPOC community. And, and so it's like, I have so much respect for you and I wanna just thank you. And I'm gonna stop rambling because I I'm, need to eat dinner so, so I can stop <laughs> rambling. <laughs> um, Mr. Vernon Jones, then Ms. Pereira. Well, thank you to Sheena, not just for your comments about me, but you know what you, what you describe as rambling is you know you're you're telling the truth uh and it it helps us all when you do that um 
I, I think we need to be a little careful about how we handle this business about benefits and whether they should be in the budget or not. Because the police department benefits are actually not in the police department budget. They're in a different you know, section of the budget. Um, so I would be fine, you know, and I think we just need to compare apples to apples. So if they want to talk positions and salaries, we can talk positions and salaries and not count the, the benefits and just say, you know, if we get the positions, then the town will have to provide the benefits. Um, so I just think we need to be consistent about how we do that and not get, you know, caught up about, you know, that. Um, the other thing is at the last, at the finance committee, when the police department presented its budget, one of the finance committee members asked the chief, will you need more overtime because you have fewer officers? And I think we need to call that out. That's, that, you, could, you can only make that statement if you don't believe the CREST program is gonna pick up um, a reasonable share of the calls. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I, I only see two ways they can oppose uh, Crest. One is if you don't believe it's going to pick up the calls, and we've got all kinds of evidence that it will. And the other is if you don't believe how much distrust and, and disrespect and fear there is on the part of the BIPOC community with regard to the police. Uh, and I think we need to call it out if they're doubting either of those things. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say in terms of what um, Tashina said, I mean, it's so so true in terms of like, you know, uh, you know, white people and, you know, the, the council, uh, the counselors, which as Ms. Pat pointed out, it's a white space, you know, that's a white space. Um, so I think though, we are making them uncomfortable. You know what I'm saying? Because that's why they're giving us so much resistance because we are pushing and we are saying, no, this is, these are our recommendations. This is the way that we need to go in order to create something different, to, to create some real change that's going to be equitable and it's gonna be inclusive of everyone in this town and not just a certain segment of this town, which again, as, as Mr. Vernon Jones was saying, you know, what are you not believing? You know, like when we were talking about you know, what Seven Gen had presented in terms of the communications they had with the folks that they interviewed, right? It's just like, are you not, you know, why are you trying to say that it was national statements or general statements? No, it was very specific to this area. This is happening here. It's not happening elsewhere. You see what I'm saying? So I think it's kind of to like really, you know, focus in on that again tomorrow, if need be, to, to, to really showcase that, no, this is what is important and this is what we need to focus on in regards to why this amount of money that you, you're going to have to spend money to put this in place so let's just get down to how much is it going to be so that we can we can put the program in place two i mean what tashina said about um though you know like a bipoc person and and how we right when we go into spaces in amherst we never feel comfortable you know we're always the the you know the one and only in all the spaces in Amherst, in the restaurants and in the stores and all of these places. And it's funny because I, I'll just say like, you know, me being from Cape Verde, right? And you all know, I travel back to Cape Verde every once in a while to see my family, which over there is majority black people, right? I come back here, I'm in utter depression as soon as I step in here. Why? Because I don't feel welcome, right? I don't feel welcome. I don't see myself here. I don't see people that look like me. I don't see people that look like me in, in, in um, leadership positions. I don't see people that look like me in any kind of positions within this within Amherst. And then what do I have to do is just kind of grit it, gr grin and bear it, right? Grin and bear it. No, we're trying to say, and that's why we're recommending diversity, equity, inclusion uh, department. No, it has to change. Why do we have to always grin and bear it? Why do we have to be the ones to always feel like we're the onlys? It shouldn't be that way, especially given, you know, what's happening in our school systems, right? That Seven Gen brought up over and over again, that 50% of, of, of at least 50% of the students in our schools, in, in our school systems are, are, are diverse. So, so then what are you doing? Why aren't you making the town uh, an inclusive, a welcoming place for everyone, right? 
So we need to kind of, you know, point that out. And then lastly, in terms of the police, I, I, and I think, you know, Mr. Virgil brought it up. I mean, we need to kind of hone in on that, right? That we're not asking for any new hires and, and Mr. Vernon Jones, I didn't even know that there was gonna be a soon to be retirement. So yes, point that out. There's that retirement, no new hires. And and yes, there will be reduction in the future because once the pro the program who hopefully is gonna be fully staffed, fully resourced, is up and running and taking that percentage of calls, then there will need to be a further reduction in the police department. Yes. But we're not going to do it haphazardly, obviously, for people who are thinking people. We're not going to do that haphazardly. But we have to make it clear that, yes, that will happen at, at some point. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, and then I have a comment. You know, this town council had passed this resolution about eliminating, you know, or undoing systemic racism. And they voted for the charge for our committee. You know that this we, we they were they were part of this. They voted a charge that said come up with alternatives to policing, come up with in you know proposals around police policy and oversight. Um, so, you know, I think we we need to be strong and firm with them, but we also need to hold them to what they've said. And hold them to the the things that they claim they have they have already claimed they support these things, so now it's time for them to put their action behind their words, uh, and I think that you know rather than us, you know I don't want to assume that they're all against us, but I do want to insist that they um, you know kind of put their money where their mouth is at this point. I talk, agree with talk and walk the walk. Sorry, I just need to say that. Talk the talk, but you got to walk the walk. Okay. Can't just talk the talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just feel like, I honestly feel like the way that town council treated us in our entire process and as like what we've experienced as a group, as of deadlines, presenting, I feel like it just illustrates how town government is a white space along with everywhere. And I tried to make that clear when um, somebody asked about the overlap between, what was it, LSSE and the Youth Empowerment Center? Like, no, because that the intention of LSSE was never to support BIPOC youth. It was never that. So by hiring BIPOC employees, it's not gonna change that the intention that it was started with. And I don't think people get that. Like, it's so frustrating to me. And I also, I just wanna say, I'm very frustrated by this process and Mr. Balkoman sort of not keeping us in the loop as to what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And Alicia and I are gonna come with a strong presentation, put all of the other recommendations before Crest because all of them deserve equal funding, especially the preventative services. Um, and I'm just very frustrated. I share the same frustration as all of you. And I also saw that Mr. Bachelman sent um, thank you notes to police officers over the last week. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that sort of degrades our work. And I think that between that and Herb's email, I'm very discouraged, but we gotta keep going and keep pushing and keep applying pressure. Uh, Ms. Pat. Oh, Ms. Pat, I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, tomorrow, um, have we thought about if they say that there is no space for youth program or they don't have any space for uh, BIPOC cultural center? I have some suggestion. The, um, the Catholic church, uh, they have a space. Um, that the town can explore for youth program because my understanding is that the youth program should be located within downtown to actually make you know kids go there. Do people know the space I'm talking about? At St. Bridges, mm -hmm. you know, it's something that we need to, you know, push out tomorrow to the finance committee. I'm also thinking in terms of. Um, the BIPOC uh, cultural center, even though like, um, I think the, the town should also explore renting space if they don't have any space. So I'm thinking the space near the Comcast building on Route 9. Do people know where Comcast is? Comcast, oh. so it's a, a vacant space there. I mean, it's not big enough 
of something that we envision that to start off with where the town keep looking that that will you know to, to start something going um because they're going to come up with we don't have buildings you know or we don't have this how are we going to get this you know be patient it will take several years it's what i'm concerned about but what i'm suggesting is that let them rent spaces you know, landlords are hurting right now. You know, this, some businesses are going out of business. So that, you know, let them look for space, you know, for the programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, Ms. Bowman, I see your hand up. Ms. Yes, Bowman. My, yep, my hand's up. Um, oh, hey, can you guys go in the other room, please? Um, so yes, absolutely. It should be, the youth center should be located in the center of town somehow. Um, I think it's, I, I think it is very reasonable to have one of the churches, um, see if one of the churches will work as a temporary space. Um, but I do say that, that um, you know, I don't know, like it gets, weird when you're in somebody else's space because you, know, you have to clean up everything every time whatever program's over so on and so forth i've been in situations like that um one of the things that i was um no i'm no walk away please um one of the other things that i was thinking about was um you have all these new you know apartment buildings popping up with with space under that. Like, you know, like the ground level floor has like, they're throwing in a restaurant or they're throwing in, you know, a workspace for the students or whatever. You know, maybe we try to get on one of those places, you know, that, you know, one of the sky rises that they're building in our town. Um, you know, the other, you know, and so I'm just like, really trying to think of those types of things. Um, there's, didn't Silver, was it Silverscape that just closed? So that that building or something, they had, I think that building just, they just closed or something. Or was it, I don't know, there was a jewelry store somewhere in, in Amherst. Um, there was a jewelry store somewhere in Amherst and that um, closed. I'm just trying to think of like, different buildings um that are just oh that are there that are that could potentially be available um yeah that's i don't know i i don't know what else to say thank you did she come here already uh, thank you miss bowman uh miss moiston i just wanted to comment on miss ferreira's first comment about you know, there's this whole thing where the council's like, well, those things don't happen here. Um, and as far as it goes with the acts that we see on TV in regards to the police and the BIPOC community. But at the same time, those are still so important because they hit home, right? Like, if your child sees that all the time, what are they going to think? Right. Like every day that we turn on the news, there's something that's linked to a police off a white police officer killing a BIPOC community member. And so that is still a very crucial point. I mean, it is how we come up with those unconscious bias ideas, right? Like peanut butter and jelly. It's just as simple. We've all been conditioned to say, you know, to think about peanut butter when you say jelly or vice versa. And those make a difference. Right. And it's no different than, so it, you still need to speak on it, but you, you need to let them know to some degree that, that they do make a difference. Like that does, it does factor in on our children. If our children only see that on the news, what are they going to think, including on top of the stuff that we or these other folks have experienced in, in Amherst? Like it's still a very crucial point, I think. Um, absolutely. Um, Ms. Walker and then Ms. Pat and then Ms. Ferreira. Um, thank you, Ms. Moisten. So I just wanted to just add to what Ms. Moisten said, because I very much agree with all of that. And just one specific comment that like, kind of really bothered me. And I was also bothered by the fact that I didn't address it directly at the town council meeting is that when there was a question of 
whether or not we were going to wait for a death to happen to address these things, they were, the response was, no, we are not going to wait for something violent to happen. Like as if violent things don't already happen, as if police don't cause violence in Amherst and as if they don't already cause harm. And so I think there is a large assumption that these things do not happen here. Like I know there has been hours and hours of testimony, but they've made it very clear that they don't believe it because they have even said like, these are just your interpretations of what have happened and these certain things. So there is a, a strong belief by the town council that violence does not occur in Amherst at the hands of the police. And I think that's like a very misleading idea that they have. And that is also fueling their optimism here. Uh, thank you, Ms. Walker, Ms. Pat, and then Ms. Pereira. So uh, one thing is if we can, you know, run this meeting to 8 p.m. because it's been a long week for everybody. Like I have a, a contract I need to like submit tomorrow. So I'm feeling pressure. Um, just to pick it back with what Alicia, you know, um, just said, when we talk about violence, as we all know, it's not just the physical, it's not just the, the shooting, you know, the emotional uh, toll that comes with even police stopping you because you're black. That one alone is violence. I don't, I don't understand why town council can get that. I don't understand why they don't understand that. That even having police follow you, just driving, and then you look back and you know, there is a cruiser just going. You know, your heart will start you know, jumping if you're a person of color. That's violence right there. So when they're talking about, you know, we don't have shooting, in our midst of violence, they're ignorant. Because if they know what we bike poor folks go through, where well, we have to talk to our children when they come in town, when they lived here, and even it's a lot of negotiating every morning to even leave your home. You know, because you're walking out, you're walking into white spaces everywhere, everywhere. The only place that is not white space for me, it's my place of employment my business, that's it. But when I'm in the community, I'm, I'm constantly negotiating everywhere. If I'm shopping, anywhere. So for them to just say that is, is, is like immature. Now for tomorrow, when we're talking about, um, we haven't talked about the um, diversity, equity, inclusion, because they want to dismiss it. You know, in a way, but we need to push back tomorrow that, you know, and show that the money invested in this department and I, you know, we should also always connect it with the, you know, a youth, prog a youth program and buy for cultural center. The money that is invested in it will have so much good return in terms of um, less involvement with the police, you know, whether it's somebody, you know, needing help with, you know, one thing or the other. We heard on, on Monday when Caroline uh, Mora had mentioned that when she was raising her, her kids, she was able to get assistance in town. That assistance is still on. And that, you know, I brought this up many, many, many times. That assistance is still on if, you, if people need help, you know, paying rent. Unfortunately, that pro that, uh, the town of Amherst moved that program to a white-led organization in Greenfield to provide that assistance to people. And what is happening is some bike park folks has tried to access those help and they were declined because of uh, cultural incompetence. I would like that program to come back so that it can be handled by the Department of um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for an example. So people are already thinking we don't have such program here. And do you blame people you don't? Because the people who are doing it for us are doing a poorly job would be an example. So I just want us to really, honing on the value 
of investment of this department and that, as well as press. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, Ms. Ferreira and then Ms. Bowman. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, um, you know, I think that's why we're so frustrated and it's just so exhausting because I think we covered it very well, you know, through the presentation, through our comments, through our opening. I mean, that was my opening in its totality was talking about my kids and, and what we have to negotiate every day before they, they, they go out the house. You know, the fear that, that any, any BIPOC mom has to go through when they have kids that are BIPOC, you know what I'm saying? Period, point blank, you know? So it's, so it's, so, but for them to still not hear, it, it's just, you know, it, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, but obviously, again, you know, we're the ones that are being tasked to do this and, and we're going to continue to fight with this and fight on and, and do what we need to do. But it, it just, it's almost like they can't hear us. You know, it's like they cannot hear what we're saying um, because to even say that there isn't, you know, that type of trauma and violence and pain in Amherst is, is, is you're living in a different world, you know? Um, but the other part is that I know Ms. Ms. Pat said eight o'clock, I actually have to go <laughs> because we were actually supposed to only meet for like an hour today. Right. Um, so I, you know, is there anything that you all need from me? If not, I need to go because you know my kids are needing me. <laughs> so, Mr. Can, we just, can we just check when our meeting is next week? Is that decided? I like Wednesday today, six o'clock. If that works for people. Uh -huh. Next Wednesday, June second. Because yeah, I've had people say that they're confused with our meetings, and I I apologize to them. I said I was the problem. I requested to have the day moved. But if it's six o'clock, I can always join in like three minutes or five minutes after. Not a big deal. I mean, I think Miss Bowman, you had said that it might be a problem for you. Just Last time we talked. Yes, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't be able to stay for the whole meeting because I'm usually like I'm probably I'm usually getting off the meeting around eight, you know, um, and we have tended to go over. So it just it's. I mean, it's, I it doesn't. I can't. I'll, I mean, I'll try to. I'll yeah, try to be. I'll, I'll try to be as. Um, I'm trying to be as flexible as possible. Wednesday is just my hardest day. Um, I, I work, um, well, I'm gonna be work, starting, probably gonna be working Wednesdays and then I go pick up my son and then I go bring him to, you know, so I'm like, I don't stop at all. So whatever so just, you guys think is fine. So just leave it on Thursday then. I was thinking it was my, because of me, but do people want to keep it on Thursday then? Thursday works for me. Yeah, I'm fine with Thursday at 5 What about you, Mr. Roth? I'm okay with Thursday. So 5.30 Thursday? Thursday is better for me. Okay. okay. 5.30 or 6? 5.30 is fine with me. 5.30 is also fine with me. Does that work for everyone else? It's fine. What about you, Mr. Roth? Okay. Okay. I, I may have a problem next week regardless of when we meet, but, but Thursdays at 5.30 is good for me. Okay. Do you rather do six? You're good? Okay. Okay, so June 2nd at 5.30? Well, it'll be June 3rd. June 3rd, okay, yeah. Yeah, June 3rd. So, oh yeah, so I'm gonna sign off, um, but um, the only other thing is that I'm thinking is that obviously we gotta focus for tomorrow, but then I guess we gotta think about the, the second part of our report, right? Um, they're saying June 30th, and so we need to think about whether do we have time to get in June 30th? Do we want an, is an, an extension and stuff like that? Because I mean, yeah, because that's going to be too close, you know, to kind of, we've, we've spent all this time trying to, to get here with the part A, and now all of a sudden we got to turn it right around and, and, and go into part B. I think we need more time. So that's something I, I, I just wanted to put it out there so we can think, think through. Uh, Ms. Pat? Also, next week, as part of our agenda, we, sh we should also talk about limiting us meeting every week because people are getting exhausted. 
Um, with summer coming and people, you know, vacation plans. So after June or something like that, we may want to think about either meeting once or twice a month. Uh, Ms. Moyston? Um, I have I, a hand for a minute. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Go um, ahead, Tishina. So, so there, there's two real quick things. One, um, Ms. Pat, I, I, I get what you're saying, but what I have done is miss meetings in order to do self-care. Um, and there's always the notes of the meeting, you know, after the fact. And I think that we, because we're on Zoom, I feel like we can pretty much Zoom from anywhere. Um, I mean, unless you have a specific reason why you can't Zoom, because I've, I've Zoomed from the car, I've Zoomed from various different places. I, you know, I try to sign in right, and I'm Zooming and listening to you guys all the way home before I even talk. That's why usually I'm not actually, I usually don't talk in the first half an hour because I'm driving, I'm actually driving home. Um, so I, I think I'm a, I'm, we've gotten so much pushback with this first situation that I'm like, I feel like if we if we back off in the summer, we may not meet back up and come, you know, when like I think I think I, I really think that this will this will allow for the um, town council to basically, you know, push us aside. Um, that being said, um, what I originally wanted to say was that, didn't we have a whole conversation? Wait, hold up. We had two conversations with Amherst PD. And in both of those conversations, do I, am I crazy or do I not remember the chief of police saying that the, some, the CREST program would be very helpful because they don't even like going to those kind of calls. And I think that needs to be brought up that this is something that even the police are asking for because these are not the calls that they want to be having to, you know, they don't, they, this is not the calls they want to be, um, was it going to, um, and it would take some of the pressure off of them. So first and foremost, why would they need more money for overtime? Because they're not doing any of that stuff, up, but on, because they're only going for, for violent calls. So any money that they have, they should have some money left over for violent calls. You know what I'm saying? And you know what I mean? For any overtime that would have to go on top of it. But they also said that they need what we're offering. They've, they said it twice that they need what we're offering. So we need to make that clear to town council when we um, have this conversation with them. I have another note really quick. Um, also, I know we're limiting a lot of stuff, but I think we really do need to throw some history facts in there um, because a lot of the reason these people don't know what's going on is because they don't have any history, historical context because the historical context of our experience at BIPOC people is different from the historical context of experience from non-BIPOC people. And when, you know, Go ahead, look it up. Look up the redlining in, in, in Amherst. Go ahead, look it up. Look up this stuff. Here it is. Here's the websites where you can get this information. Some like something needs to be said about the history and where, you know, whether it be, you know, we'll share, you know, we'll have some sort of links up somewhere where we can just put the links up and you can you have it is your response. I say that this is your responsibility as a town committee that you need to go to these links and read these links and understand what it has happened in this town and what has happened in this country to create this environment. This is an intentional environment that's been created. Fear in the BIPOC community of policing is intentional. So I just, I really feel like that historical content is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. Yeah, so um, Tashina, we actually did go, you know, the, the, the two co-chairs went a lot into it, like the whole historical aspect the only thing is is that in terms of tomorrow we need to maximize you know i mean we can go into some of it and like you said maybe put some links on there but the thing is is that we really went they went deep into it last time which i thought was very thorough 
Um, and then the other part about the police, that was a point that I brought up at, during the meeting. I actually said, Chief Livingstone said, blah, 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 blah. So I didn't make it, we can make the point again. It's not a bad thing to bring it up again, but just, just letting you know that I did bring that up specifically. Oh, uh, I, I, I believe that all of that stuff came up already. I'm just saying that every time we have conversations with these people, this needs to be brought up. We bring it up this, again. No yeah, doubt. we need to be like, it needs to be like hitting them in the head every time they think of, you know, every time they interact, they need to be hit with some sort of historical fact. Hey, you know, here it is, document, boom, there it is. There it is. Do you know, and I mean, like, look, we could be even as far as, do you know your neighborhood specifically kept Black people out? You don't think that that affects how Black people are living when you start hitting direct neighborhoods? Oh, Miss So-and-so, you, don't you live in this neighborhood? Well, oh, your neighborhood, here's what it looks, here's what it says for your neighborhood. You, your, your people kept, you know, kept people, you, you know, people, BIPOC people out. Like, and really pointing out when making it hit home. That's the thing, we gotta make it hit home. And I think that we're coming close, but we haven't hit that yet. We haven't hit that point yet. We're like, oh, your family owned slaves, okay? Here, here it is, here's the thing. You know what I'm saying? Like on that level where, you know, people are like really feeling it. So I don't know, that's just my yeah, thought. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go so, but the only thing I have to say, um, Tashina, I mean, I get, I get what you're saying, but remember, we're not gonna change these people's viewpoints in terms of their own historical complex. I mean, that's, that's, they have a, a certain worldview that's very set, you know what I'm saying? And I, I, you know, because remember, we went into all of this stuff about about the violence in, in Amherst, and they got out of it and basically said, you know, wait, we don't we don't we don't have any of these things in Amherst. You see what I'm saying? So in terms of my thing is is that we're not going to be able to change these folks whatsoever. Right. You know what I'm saying? They're going to be who they're going to be. My only thing is, is that we need to maximize the time to make sure though, that we get in what we need to get in to make sure that, that we break down this budget, we break down our recommendations, we take the time to do that so that we, we can put out what it is that we need. You know what I'm saying? Because I, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not in the business, you know, obviously I've done it for many years, but, but right now in this group, my business is not educating these folks. You know, my business is getting what's needed for our com for, for, for our community, by pocket especially, but for the entire residents of, of Amherst. That's my that's my that's my charge. But with that, I'm out. <laughs> Bye, Miss Ferreira. Bye. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Um, Miss Moisten. Um, I just want to say that the concept of white space is very hard for the a lot of people. I don't want to make it limited to and you know, when they think about it in the concept of someone came over here and said, we are going to make these rules. The rules were really only meant for white men, never mind everybody else, right? Like these rules were made for white men. And not only did those people come over here, but they divided their own people because they were just selfish and greedy. So what it right like what it really comes down to to some degree you know they basically divide it and said you guys will be scholars and you guys will be farmers and you guys will be this and they gave those what they were considering the lower class white people enough privilege so that they could feel like they were better than the negro or the indigenous people and it, it caused purposefully everything has been done very purposefully so that it keeps these groups instead of coming together to realize that this group is not good to keep them arguing so that it's like a part of a bit of the history there that could help possibly understand the white space concept I, they just don't understand it because they live in it and it's so hard to explain to people when they live in it and they don't have to think about what it's like to walk through a store and be watched that that's what happens to you only based off of the color of your skin and the other thing i wanted to mention and i can't remember i think it was miss pat who spoke about it a little bit about the violence with the police the other thing is there's a certain level of uh privileged power that the police have that probably could be addressed right so while you know miss pat might say violence and it is right there's it's anything that's traumatizing is considered violence but it's it is like a a power struggle thing with them right like you're not going to tell me what you're going to do and you're going to do like it is a it's a an issue of power um 
which can be considered un fall underneath that term of violence. And, uh, you know, I just think that that should be something perhaps that could be considered in, in terms of it too, is that, I mean, we had a person who was having a hard time. They've been to every floor. They screamed, they yelled, and someone from the second floor, because I was the only one up here, called the police because this we didn't know what was going to happen but one police who got off the elevator was like nine i mean he was huge right and so he gets off the elevator and he's like you're gonna come with me we're gonna get on this elevator and the guy's like i'm not getting in the elevator i don't ride in elevators another officer came up and was like come on we're gonna go down the stairs right he met him where he is but the point of that really is is that th there's that power that privilege of power that, that was in play there and it's just like it has to be addressed, right? Because that is a big piece of it that falls underneath that umbrella of violence. Definitely, and I think also too, like one thing that makes it hard for them to understand is they benefit from the privilege of white spaces. So of course they don't understand because I bet other people listening to that situation would be like, oh, why didn't the person just get in the elevator? <laughs> Yep. But when I'm hearing that, I'm like, okay, why? Like, it makes sense. The person's anxious and they want to go down the stairs. And I don't even know the demographics of the person. No, and it, and, but honestly, it doesn't even matter because, well, it does, but it doesn't, right? Because sometimes it's strictly just about, you. Can, I'm a police officer, you're going to do what I say. And then that's just it, right? Like, that's the piece of it. Um, yeah, it, the, the power is, it's a power thing. It's, and it's hard. It's, it's brutal so for sure thank you Ms. Moisten um did anybody have any other comments um if not I wanted to motion to adjourn just because we did go a little bit over this evening second day when did we not go over I mean like what's that <laughs> <laughs> we should have known right in our meeting <laughs> uh, one thing I didn't understand why uh, Ms. Moisten didn't get called in on on Monday you didn't come into the meeting like when we came in. I mean, you attended, but oh, you didn't hear me. Am I? Oh, whatever. Anyway. I mean, it's not really my space, and I'm okay with that. And, you know, everybody was very, you know, I'm, I'm going to just say emotions, and everybody was, it was ready to go. And it, it's not necessarily my space to, to, it's not my platform. It's your guys's platform. No. And I and and often, and I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I was wondering, like, what happened because we specifically wanted you to join us, and I don't know what happened. But also, like, they don't show Athena at their meetings either. Like, and we can just call it a power or LA. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Sometimes I just shouldn't. Yeah. Well, okay. As as we're concerned. You're one of us, Jennifer. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And we yeah. appreciate your work. We appreciate you so, so much. You don't even know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all I need, really, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jen. Yes, Miss Bowman. Miss Moisten. Miss Bowman. Uh, can you call me about Mr. Bowman? Yes, I can. Because <laughs> I think Mr. Bowman and your Mr. are together. Oh, oh, I don't know about that, but let's talk about that off the meeting because we are being recorded. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye, bye. Everybody. Thank you to All our right. chairs for the work you're going to do tonight. <laughs> yes. Um, if you need me, let me know. Okay. You guys did awesome. You guys did awesome. And you'll do awesome tomorrow. And don't back down. Like, just go for it. Yep. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.